Hey, it's Chuck. We are going to have real talk on age positivity, which you heard of, versus age objectivity, which I'm bringing up now. Um, real talk means you could just to listen, not watch, because I'm just going to be painting my nails. Nothing much to look at. Um, the t-shirt, though, I want you to be able to read. It says, do the fucking work. I know, but it's okay. I can swear on social media now because I'm 50. 50 and over, your excuse. And by the way, my age has nothing to do with any biases on this topic, okay? Um, age positivity. Well, first came body positivity. Then came age positivity in the same vein, in the same trend. And now I'm bringing you age objectivity. We're gonna talk a little bit, you know, about the body too, just because there's some parallels, but you'll you'll catch them as I talk about age positivity and age objectivity. All right, so just to make sure we're not confused on um, objectivity, we're not talking about objectifying, I'm talking about being objective. Okay, when I say objectivity. So let me just give you um, a dictionary definition of objective to get that out of the way. And uh, that is uh, expressing or dealing with facts or conditions as perceived without distortion by personal feelings, prejudices, or interpretations. One more time, expressing or dealing with facts or conditions as perceived without distortion by personal feelings, prejudices, or interpretations. Of course, you can feel whatever you want to feel about anything, and nothing against feelings of positivity. And you can, of course, just as easily feel unduly negative, right? Such as, such as basing your happiness on body size and shape, um, or thinking that some age number is over the hill and usually, you know, both instances, it's just due to some preconceived conditioning and notions. So also, this is not to discount the importance, okay, or validity of one's subjectivism or subjective experience. Um, your feelings are valid, right? And oftentimes it's the only thing that matters. What I'm trying to differentiate differentiate here is feeling whatever for the heck of it versus owning your subjective standards um, because you're able to measure it or track it back to objective data and still, you know, own that subjective reality or experience for you. So when it comes to age, the main objective factor, of course, is simply your chronological age. How you react to that number is is totally up to you. Now, then we have other measurements of age um, grouped under functional age, right? The main one being biological. Now, biological age simply means it's, it's a measure of your um, physiological, biological functions as with somebody of the same chronological age, okay? So the only caveat I'm gonna put in here is that sometimes your biological age is influenced, you know, by things that really are outside of your control when it comes to things like having a physical condition or illness or disease. But your biological age um, is otherwise very influenceable, okay? And there's this bi-directional influence as well between other functional age uh, measures such as your psychological age and your social age, okay? So um, that means that both things or all three things could have an influence on each other for good or for bad. So, your basically your perspective on age is is going to have an effect on the age, right? That makes sense. And so you could say or think that 
be, you know, be in the camp that thinks, oh, age is just a number, age doesn't matter. And, and you could just dive into that positivity, you know, trend. But then you're in danger of ignoring objective data. Now, you could think, on the other hand, you could think that, oh, I'm 35, I'm old, okay? And then it's all down downhill from here. You could be in that camp and then you're in danger of missing the full actualization of like half your life because you're most likely going to live until like 80. And that would mean, you know, you've got more than half your life left. Now, I do believe that we should all assume we're going to live to 100, even if that sounds like a high number to you right now. And even in the in the face of, you know, some some data suggesting our lifespan is actually on the decline. But I think that's a blip. Okay, because there there's too many uh, research, too much research and studies and advances in medicine and technology that um, I think a hundred is a very real number really, really soon. But you know, in my case, if I use the age hundred, that's half my life. If I use the age eighty, that's still like thirty eight percent or so of my life. So that's a lot to to think like it's not going to get better or there's not, you know, a lot to look forward to. There's this beautiful word in gerontology, which is senescence. Okay, senescence just means the natural deterioration of uh, that comes with age, right? So it's it's the normal aging process. Now, does it make sense? It makes sense that there's normal wear and tear as we, you know, go up in age and that there would be certain declines or, or changes, you know, at worst um, in, is it at worst or best? And I'm sorry, it's, it's late and I'm tired, but there's going to be declines in biological functions, you know, cognitive functions, but even with a cognitive decline, the natural cognitive decline, there's nothing that these objective facts, nothing that senescence, you know, uh, says about the quality of our living, right? So, you know, we have agency over this entropy. So this is where this whole positivity trend could take sort of a wrong turn, okay? Um, the confusion comes, I think, because there's this cutoff around the age 45, 50, where we're all adults, but the difference between two people who are age 55 or two people who are age 65 or two people who are 80, the difference between them could be so vast, right? That once we hit the age 50, which is technically the aging population is what we call them. Um, I mean, there's like, there's no rhyme or reason, okay? In, in, in seeing the difference between two people, you know, possible versus before age 50, before age 45, we have the pretty distinct categories of biological development um, and stages, right? There's infancy and there's adolescence, you know, we go through puberty and then we, uh, you know, become young adults and then adults and, um, and then we hit that point around 45, 50, where, you know, we hit menopause and menopause, I include men, okay? Cause they go through their own version and come on, you know, that men PMS a lot harder than any woman does. Okay. So because after the age of 50 or so that there is, or could be such a big difference, this is where we could really see that it's not just about, you know, genetics or chronological age, but so much of the lifestyle factor, which 
you know, I'm gonna push for, I'm not gonna go ahead and name like things that, that of course we know could, could have a speed track the aging process, right? There's uh, drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, you know, all that stuff, stress, high levels of stress, et cetera, pollution but really focus on, of course, the, the biggest positive factor to slow that rate of decline, which is of course exercise. And um, where I see this trend of age positivity the most, like take a turn um, for I think some contortions, misconceptions is where we have people who are um, pushing or marketing like fit over 50, like as if that's a big deal, right? Cause then you think uh, you, you automatically, like they're boasting about being fit over 50 or 40 as if that's a big deal, but we shouldn't market that as a big deal, right? We should really it kind of get that to be the norm. Okay. Or you have exercises for 50 year olds or exercises for six year olds instead of exercises for your fitness level, exercises for your, you know, your body's capabilities or level. So, you know, I can see where the confusion comes because most of what we see after 50 is pretty, you know, grim in terms of, at least in terms of physical fitness. And, but the thing I want you to think about, okay, is that when we see, when we're talking about a decline, we're talking about a decline from some sort of a peak, right? But most of the population, even before the age of 50, is in already in a decline or never had a, a peak to decline from, right? So I think this is a misconception that we have, that we look at people over 50 and see a huge, you know, uh, dunk in, in the state of their health or fitness and think that, oh, it's because they're 50, when in fact it's because before they were 50, they were not, you know, up to, um, they were probably biologically younger than what they should, or older than what they should have been, right? So listen, senescence, a natural decline is perfectly fine. It's objective and we work with it, right? But to, you know, ignore the examples of the number of people who are over 50, who are 60, 70, 80, and very, very fit, okay? We can't ignore such a big number, even though they're a small percentage of the population. The examples are too many for us to just chalk them off as like genetic, genetically lucky people. Okay, so, okay, so in conclusion, okay, we shouldn't obsess about reversing aging or preventing aging, at least not the natural decline, um, because that would deny the beauty of, of living. So a positive stance um, on your body and age is, is great, but I just want it to be tied to, a, to these objective standards. So for example, for, you know, for your health and fitness, there's metrics. Um, such as the VO2 max, your muscle mass, your bone density. Um, and then there's, you know, weight factors that we know statistically, right? Have a link to um, heart disease, all of that. So in light of that, if you can be positive, right? Uh, in light of real life, if you could be positive with the objective sensibilities, you know, that would be, the the ideal so that you can um be clear where you stand still choose to be positive while we're while you're working towards improvement um you know so i'm not so keen on this positively positivity trend okay be as positive as you want to but 
make sure you tie it to objective standards.